Good afternoon all. Uh, thank you for joining uh, today's uh, talk by Professor Sinjia Gianetti from uh, Swansea University. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Gianetti today's, uh, uh, for the today's talk. Sinjia Gianetti is a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Swansea University, where she co-leads the Materials and Manufacturing Research Institute. Sinjia is passionate about developing transformative technologies that can produce a societal and economic impacts. In her role as co-director of the Materials Made Smarter Research Center, she leads digitalization initiatives, pioneering the development and integration of artificial intelligence in manufacturing industries. She is a co-investigator in the EPSRC Center for Doctoral Training, which trains and nurtures an inclusive and diverse community of leaders in digital innovations. Sinjia has been actively involved in digital manufacturing research for over a decade. She was awarded an engineering doctorate in advanced and sustainable manufacturing from Swansea University in 2015 and became an academic member of staff in 2016. She has been a recipient of UK RI EPSRC Digital Manufacturing Fellowship from 2018 to 2021 and has a track record of successful grant capture and delivery from a variety of sources worth of more than 10 million pounds. Her current research focus on the application of hybrid A modeling approaches to generate actionable insights and enhance decision-making capabilities in complex industrial systems. She has made significant contributions to the development of novel data-driven approaches to improve the efficiency and sustainability of manufacturing processes with development successfully applied to different areas of manufacturing. Prior to her academic career, Sinzia worked in industry for a decade where she led projects in software and consumer products development. Today, Sinzia has kindly accepted our invitation to give a talk on data-driven innovations in manufacturing for a sustainable future. Thank you, Sinzia, for your uh, uh, time, and I invite you now to present your talk. Thank you, Pankaj, and thank you for inviting me to give this talk. It's uh, really exciting to be here, and you know, this is a summary of what you just said. Um, I am very passionate about uh, digital manufacturing, and I've been in the field for you know several years, and you know, going along the journey of you know Industry 4.0. So I will share with you some of the insight from my research, and also the journey where digitalization and Industry 4.0 is moving. So this is the outline of the talk. I'll start to talk about Industry 4.0, definition drivers and sustainability, and then I will move through example of my research use cases uh, to talk about application of AI for sustainable manufacturing. And finally, I will share some reflection on the future outlook. So what is Industry 4.0 and where are we now? I mean, the term Industry 4.0 has been around for a long time. Uh, it was uh, um, introduced in 2011, and it really it is uh, considered the next developmental stage of industrial production through convergence of uh, several digital technology. We call them industrial digital technologies, which include the Internet of Things, uh, sensor, AI, additive manufacturing, uh, virtual reality, and so on and so forth, and you know, um, collaborative robots. And this is really driven by what we call the cyber physical system which are integrators of physical and connectivity and enables these systems, the factory, and uh, to connect and exchange information real time. So this system generates large amount of data and we use this data to drive improvement. The terms, you know, uh, what is industry 4.0 has, has evolved in this year. And, you know, we see within industry more and more digitalization, but the full vision, I think, is still not, not realized yet. Starting with Industry 4.0, I think one of the main drivers was uh, to have a smart factory that is flexible, that uh, can produce goods very customized and batch size one is called. There, were, there was a lot of, you know, um, um, importance given to productivity, competitiveness and increased efficiency. 
as we move throughout the years, and now it's been more than 10 years, we can see also some drivers towards more sustainability, and we will see how this driver has ch have changed. As I mentioned, we have a number of technologies that comprise this Industry 4.0 technology. It's not one single technology that enables this uh, productivity improvement, but in the integration of those. In particular, in this talk, I will focus on one aspect, the main aspect, which is the use of AI, which is my main area of research. But all these technologies overall contribute to Industry 4.0. Now, you can see from this uh, um, uh, you know, old report, uh, these, are, these were the value drivers identified by this uh, uh, McKinsey report. And you can see all these drivers are, have some economic va economical value, you know, productivity increase, uh, increase, you know, reducing the cost of uh, quality, reducing the cost of inventory, and, you know, reducing the machine downtime, and so on. Uh, so we, we saw at the beginning of Industry 4.0 being really heavily on achieving this productivity improvement competitiveness. As we have moved throughout the years, I think Industry 4.0, the real potential of Industry 4.0 and digitalization of manufacturing processes is in creating sustainable industrial value creation. So therefore, we do not only place value on the economic value, but also we consider the environment and the sustainability. So we drive process improvement through, you know, reduction of emission and achieving more sustainability. And ultimately aiming to the circular economy, so to keep resources for as long as possible, reduce the use of raw materials, reduce the waste uh, contributing to the circular economy. So you can see here how, uh, you know, Industry 4.0 sustainability and circular economy are now all interconnected to each other. And we can achieve the circular economy by applying digital technologies. For instance, we can improve the design and customization of product through efficient use of materials. So we can develop products that uh, can stay longer in use, that are right first time. And then through flexible production, we can enable mass customization. Of course, we can achieve a whole range of uh, process efficiencies, redu reduction of use of resources, quality improvement, waste re um, reduction of waste and emissions, and operational effectiveness. And this is done typically by you know, using data from sensor and using artificial intelligence to make those improvements. One big characteristic of Industry 4.0 system is the ability of what is called horizontal integration, which is the ability to um, basically uh, share data across the value chain. And this enables to um, increase transparency, visibility in production, and uh, through, for instance, the management of reverse logistics, product take back, remanufacturing, and recycling. Finally, uh, these technologies, and especially the integration of data, enable industrial symbiosis and servitization. So really, we have a whole range of technologies that can really drive more sustainable production and the circular economy. And this is where we are focusing in two of the key main projects where I work, the Sustain Future Manufacturing Research Hub, where also Michael and you know, some other people in Warwick are involved, uh, um, we are uh, aiming to develop a greener, cleaner, and smarter steel. And in particular, we are focused on the adoption of AI to be able to drive this improvement. Uh, here, our focus is, you know, using data from the plant and legacy data to be able to use this data, create predictive model to improve process operations. Um, we also, I also work in another project, which is the Material Made Smarter Research Center, which I co-direct. And this is a um, center that uh, brings together several university and industrial partners. And our vision is to digitalize uh, the material, materials intensive industry, to drive productivity improvement, but also to change the way we value and use um, in the material within society. So we are looking at uh, performance on demand, so achieving right first time material but we are also looking at supply chain transparency, digital material passport, and the, the use of semantic technologies. So these are some of the activities between these two um, hub, the Sustainable Manufacturing Research Hub, and uh, the Material Made Smart. The talk today focuses on more the modeling capabilities and the use of AI to improve uh, manufacturing processes. So 
uh, this is just to give an overview what are the main drivers of you know my research so in the remaining of the talk i will be talking about uh, you know the use of ai in sustainable manufacturing with some example from my research this will mainly focus on steel but i will also introduce one example on metal packaging okay so um I, I put here in this chart, uh, um, you know, a little bit the evolution of the analytics. Uh, and you can see that, you know, in terms of manufacturing process processes, we have been used uh, data and analytics for decades, you know, starting from statistical process control, Six Sigma. So we use data to really understand what has happened. You know, we analyze data to understand why things happen, so finding root causes. But nowadays, with the availability of uh, AI, machine learning, we are also able to develop quite powerful predictive models. So not only we are able to analyze what has happened in the past, but we are able to predict some future occurrences when, for instance, the machine is going to fail, the likelihood of failure, so what type of defects may occur. Um, and then we can use this predictive model really to drive uh, improved decision making. And this is actually, I think, one of the most difficult steps going from a predictive model to, towards using the predictive model to drive optimal decision making. There is complexity at lev every level of uh, at the application of the AI and machine learning pipeline to real world data start with the acquisition, then the storage, and then the development of the model. And then we need to also to provide some visualizations. And you can see, you know, we have different processing types like real time data, batch data, time in motion, data in motion. And also we have different data types and different uh, pipelines. So the, there is quite a lot of complexity. Uh, so the application of AI to manufacturing is not only about developing a good predictive model, but it's about developing a model that we can actually use, we can present, and we can actually act upon that, you know, ultimately leading to new insight for process improvement. The talk is going to focus, I'll focus on one particular type of kind of AI. And, you know, AI is this broad term, which, you know, uh, means different things to different people, but really it means uh, having computers that are able to, to carry out tasks that are more human-like, that humans can do, you know, can, you know, predict things, so, you know, um, um, understand the speech or visual perceptions. Um, you know, lately uh, there's been some advances in uh, in machine learning, and one particular type of machine learning is called deep learning. And I'm sure most of you, you know, are, are, are aware. Um, and deep learning refers to the techniques for learning high-level features from data in a hierarchical manner. So we are learning pattern, but we are able to do with a large amount of data and doing what we call feature extraction. So a typical pipeline with the traditional machine learning model involves the feature extraction process, okay, where uh, which usually we want to extract the main signals from the data. And this usually takes a lot of time. With deep learning, we are able to uh, process large data set, which means we are able to process a large number of variables and a large number of observations. And we can learn complex features and patterns that usually are non-linear, very difficult to model with some equations. So uh, I've applied this on to several manufacturing processes and several use cases. So, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, a, like an expert in metallurgy, I'm not a metallurgist, but I work closely with, you know, industrial partners, you know, knowledgeable people, and we are looking at, uh, you know, developing and deploying AI models for improvement of manufacturing. So I please prepare a snapshot of kind of four use cases. One is uh, process monitoring through computer vision. Uh, another one is on automated root cause analysis, then time series for recasting. And finally, we'll talk about transfer learning applied to metal packaging. Hopefully I will manage to cover all of this, but maybe uh, I will need to rush the last one, but we'll see how it goes. Okay. So, uh, as I said, I focus more this one on the use cases of steel, you know, given the audience. And uh, as I said, you know, you know much more than me uh, about steel. I'm trying to present some ideas uh, uh, about, you know, really showing the potential of this uh, deep learning model in order to kind of help uh, uh, to um, drive uh, improvement in the processes. 
So you all know uh, steel manufacturing and you know what I find really exciting about steel manufacturing is like uh, it provides a like huge quantity of data. Your steel plants are really data rich. Uh, however, it's challenging to apply uh, predictive to develop predictive model because the data quality is poor to, due to the large scale and complex operation and there are gaps in the data. Uh, so we need to address these gaps. Uh, the type of data is also continuous, you know, streaming data uh, because we have continuous execution systems and um, sometimes data is sample at irregular intervals. So we have issues when we need to process this data. One big uh, um, really problem of uh, that we need to overcome when uh, we are looking at steel, uh, the steel manufacturing data is that we have uh, uh, data coming from um, you know, disparate sources, different machines, sensors. We have data coming from human and we need really to integrate and synthesize this data to be able to reach a correct conclusion and make real time decision. And this correct conclusion you know, can not only affect you know, the bottom line and profitability of the plant, but you know, there could be also health and safety if you know, we, we make the wrong decision. So uh, safety critical you know, decision making is really important. And then uh, uh, the other thing is that you know, um, um, steel manufacturing is automated, but still relies heavily on the knowledge of experts that know a particular plant, that know what they need to do to achieve optimal process operation. So uh, the AI adoption in uh, steel making requires a deep collaboration between domain experts, data scientists, machine learning and first principles. So all the work that I've shown to you is has been done, you know, by working with the partners and the domain experts, um, because uh, you don't don't need all the computer scientists that are able to kind of or mathematicians that are able to develop these kind of machine learning models. Okay. okay. So this example, again, very, very intuitive. I mean, we know computer vision has uh, really advanced in the, the last few years, and now computer vision systems are probably better than human at computer vision tasks, especially object detection. So in this work, and we have got several use cases, I'm presenting only one. This is work is done as part of uh, an NGD research, and this is um, Callum, um, one of my NGD students. And here we are looking at uh, remote monitoring of processes using a uh, leveraging on computer vision. In this case, what we are aiming to do is to um, monitor the um, ladle movement using a camera system. And we want to do that through kind of a video. And we want to estimate the pooling height, pooling rate, and the flame. Severity. And this is important because it enables us to understand the process. So the movement of the ladle can influence the flames, the fumes, and the dust, and hence have a, a, a detrimental impact on the environment. So uh, by doing this, we are able kind of to un better understand the, the process to, with the aim to try to improve it. So we have used a state of the art um, uh, computer vision model based on deep learning, and we have uh, taken video from a camera feed. And we have, as you can see from the video here, we have been able to track the movement of the ladle. And this offers a very cost effective solution to monitor a process in a very harsh environment that otherwise would not be uh, possible. Uh, of course, this task is not as uh, simply using off the shelf uh, or you know available software is that we need to modify this software and create a pipeline to be able for instance to the noise the image because of you know all the, all the dust and uh, the noisy environment so uh, this uh, step consists of you know the the process that we have applied consists of several steps so image denoising and then segmentation and then we are able to uh, estimate the height, the rotation and the severity. And this work has been published here. So if anyone wants to look at more details. We have several case studies, so we can see basically that just using a simple camera and using advanced deep learning model to do object detection, we can remote monitor a whole range of process. It does take time to develop this model, but you know it's kind of a cost effective solution. We are looking currently also to explore the deployment of this model on more like edge computing. OK, another way we have been using computer vision advances is uh, to apply to discover automated uh, root cause analysis. 
We know that each year millions of tons of steel are rolled by steel company, but however, uh, various defects still occur and this influences the bottom line and there's a negative effect on the environment. We have procedure to determine root causes of defects, but they are mostly done through a manual analysis and require a lot of time. So there is an inconsistent time scale in which defects might go unrecognized. So with uh, some here, some here we have developed a number of machine learning uh, models to be able to identify defects and their root causes. We have focused our work in the um, hot mill, and this is kind of uh, uh, the hot mill really produced a massive amount of data. Um, so we have focused this work into um, looking at weed defects and developed several machine learning algorithms and then created a, a pipeline um, and a visualization in a single framework. And again, uh, maybe this defect could be detected and could be analyzed, a root cause identified by people, but by automating this, uh, we save a lot of time and we remove uh, you know, the, the time between when the, the failure occurs to when the resolution is, is found. Okay? So, and you know, all the data manipulation, the data aggregation is done uh, automatically. So, as I said, more is explained on uh, on this paper here, but you know one of the use cases we have uh, implemented is uh, to the classification of uh, necking defects. Okay, so we have uh, basically looked at this uh, anti-necking control, which is a quick adjustment of the edge rolls in the hot mill. Um, which, uh, if these strokes are, uh, uh, you know, these strokes are used to mitigate to mitigate necking, and the necking is a type of defects when, uh, um, you know, the width or at the head of the or the tail of the bar is different from uh, the main body, and basically, but however, if these strokes are too early, then they can cause further necking. So what we've done here, we've taken the edge force in the roughing mill and the roller capsule position. So two signals coming from different data set. We have created these images and, you know, you can see by high how you can identify an early stroke uh, or an OK stroke. Um, we can do this very effectively by using a deep learning model that is able to do image detection. So in order to train this model, we can use a pre-trained neural network like GoogleNet. This is a network that uh, detects everyday objects. We can train with a small data set and are able then to identify defects quite accurately. So basically we are replicating the ability of humans to see, to see pattern. And, uh, but of course the computer system can do it much quicker. The data is kind of aggregating and taking automatically. So it's much faster. This process is much, much faster. So again, this was another interesting application of computer vision. Of course, we have done other model where instead of using images, we use the raw signal. And you know, this is and through some feature extraction, this is equally uh, working, but I wanted to kind of put it into the context of computer vision here. Okay, so we've seen computer vision, which is, you know, um, we have, uh, you know, a pre-trained model, which we can use and we can adapt and use legacy data and you know, really drive uh, improvement in uh, manufacturing processes. I'm moving now to another type of uh, um, modeling where we use instead time series data, so which is the time series forecasting. Again, deep learning model really good at forecasting uh, for multivariate data. So this work, which is, um, I mean, it's been an ongoing effort starting from my fellowship and now um, moving on, you know, to sustain and the material made smarter. And uh, I am also collaborating with Michael here. And um, so this is uh, this work aims at predicting the silicon content in the blast furnace. And, you know, I. As you know, the blast phoenix is very complex uh, operation, thermochemical reactor, uh, and uh, um, basically it takes uh, coke and iron ore, uh, hot, hot air is blast from the bottom, and then the hot metal is produced. Uh, within the plant, uh, the silicon content is used to, um, uh, as, as a parameter to monitor the thermal stability of the blast furnace, and it needs to be kept within certain limit. Uh, 
the plus one is very complex operation and it's really difficult to model from first principles. I would say, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, very, very difficult to achieve. So in the last few years, and there is a lot of research around, data-driven models have been used to try to predict the silicon content. And the silicon content is, um, you know, one of the challenges in this type of prediction is that this um, silicon content is sampled at irregular intervals, uh, about every two hours, but the sample is taken to the lab. So we don't really know when uh, we have the measurement. There is no online continuous measurement. And this one of, uh, um, you know, it makes it more difficult to, uh, to do uh, this data-driven prediction. Uh, so, in terms of the modeling, we want to predict the one step ahead, two step ahead, or three step ahead uh, silicon content. We have, uh, uh, and you know, if we know this prediction, then we can support a more preemptive, pre preemptive approach in uh, uh, controlling and optimize blasphemous operations. The process is lagged. And uh, as I said, this silicon, hot metal silicon content is uh, a sample at irregular intervals. So the first thing we did is to try a data driven approach. And this is the work I've done as part of my fellowship. Um, so the idea, just to see from this visualization, is that we have a number of variables that we use kind of as an input. And then we want to predict the uh, silicon content, you know, in the future time steps. And this is very complex because all these input variables come at irregular interval. The silicon content is itself is sample at irregular interval. And you cannot just use, you know, uh, I mean, you need to do a lot of interpolation before, you know, using these machine learning models, okay? So uh, it took a while to look at the variables. And I think, you know, many, many variables we reduced to 21 variables. We have four years of operation and the task is to predict the next uh, uh, hot metal silicon um, content of the next uh, uh, cast. So we implement this one as a purely data driven method where we give some exogenous variables. So the exogenous variables are this one here. And then, uh, oh, sorry. Um, and then we also give the value of the silicon content at previous time steps. So we implement this. So, so this is the first time compared to the literature when deep learning has been applied. And the, so if you look at the other method in the literature applied before, is we have a lot of data pre-processing, interpolation that needs to be done. Uh, using deep learning vastly remove this interpolation, the step of feature extraction. Also, feature extraction you know, takes a lot of time. This is particularly important if we need to retrain the model you know, several times, it's better, um, you know, it would take a lot of time to again re-extract the feature and so on. So this is the main advantage of you know, the deep learning. So we can create some uh, layers here, and we have a feature extraction layer where we give the exogenous variable. And then we uh, take the autoregression variable, which are these, these Y, and uh, merge together, and we have a few dense layers. So this, this is the, like a bit of technical details on the architecture, and we use three different deep learning models, face LSTM, CNN, LSTM, and autoencoders. Okay? I won't give details of what this has, but the face LSTM, uh, it's an LSTM that is able to deal with uh, irregularly sampled data. So we don't have to do any interpolation to get the same type of sampling um, or resampling. Um, so I think it, it's, it's easier to uh, implement. We use a work forward validation where we divide the data set into 40 folds and we use some of the, fold, the, the, the data for training and the other for test. So we have effectively 40 test set and we average the result across those. Uh, this is a very robust way of uh, doing validation for uh, time series data, for data that evolves in time. Oh, so these are the result, the result that we obtain from the dat purely data-driven model. And we can see this is the R square is not perfect. However, however, it's able to predict the sign of variation. And you know, it's a model that is kind of give some you know good results. Not 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 good to be used uh, really for. Uh, online process monitoring as yet but you know it just we we this is quite a difficult task um so these results are better than 
you know, results in the literature, um, uh, you know, for purely data driven model. And uh, the other thing is that the, we have tested in uh, like uh, uh, four years data, one year data, but you know, trained on three years data. So we have a very robust estimation of the error. Current work, uh, which uh, we are doing in a collaboration also with uh, Michael and as part of Sustain uh, Material Made Smart uh, project. Uh, now, what I haven't said here is we do a one step ahead. When we start to do the multi step ahead, results are not good. OK, and uh, we hope to overcome this by using an hybrid model. So we need to think we've got some uh, gaps in the in the measurement of data. And therefore, um, we can we want to overcome these gaps by uh, using a steady state model. So a physics based model uh, that we can use to augment the data. So you can see from this animation um, and then we can uh, achieve a more robust uh, um, estimate. Sorry, I'm just trying to move. OK, I don't know if you see this one here. So the idea is that we have all our data, but then we have some calculated aside that we give to the model to be able to improve the prediction. So we are going towards a model that we call it gray, gray box model, where we give a little bit of uh, understanding of the physics to try to address some of the gaps in the data. OK. So these are uh, some preliminary results, but this is kind of ongoing work. And this again are results for one step ahead, while we are working towards multi-step ahead. Okay, so I think there is still a bit of time here to cover the final case study. And I'm particularly keen to talk about this because I think, uh, I don't know, how many of you are familiar with transfer learning, but transfer learning is uh, a paradigm by which we can actually use models that have been trained in a domain and we can use it with a small, da small uh, the data set and retrain this model. So uh, we are able to kind of train with a smaller data set. Um, so we have applied this deep learning, deep transfer learning for developing cyber twins of machines and I'll explain what it is. I mean, if you think about the smart factory, it's kind of a factory where everything, machine, people, products are all connected to each other. They can exchange information real time so it can drive uh, optimal production and better decision making. Uh, we uh, this is the architecture of cyber physical systems and uh, within this architecture we have the cyber level where in order to achieve the vision of the cyber physical system we need to have twin models of components and machines so we can use deep and deep learning is really considered one of the key enablers to, to build smart factories and it's been used more and more um, in uh, in industry so we want to create some digital twins I, I call it cyber twin because um, of a process which is called the drawing process. This is the process for a CAN production system. And we have uh, within the process some body makes, makers machines that are able to produce a full length CAN, a full size CAN from a cup through a series of presses. And it's important to understand the performance of the body maker because uh, sometimes they cause unexpected downtime. Uh, and uh, we can, uh, if we have some prediction of the behavior of the machine, we can improve the scheduling across the plant. As these typically are considered some bottlenecks. So we, our problem, just to say, we have a machine, number of stroke, we measure the speed of the machine as a number of stroke per minute. And we want to, to predict the speed of the machine in a 10 minute ahead wind. OK, so we have a number of observations and, you know, we have our data set uh, that has been given and we can use deep learning to be able to uh, develop a very accurate model that is able to predict the multi step ahead. Uh, machine speed and this has been published. This was actually one of the first uh, model of deep learning applied to manufacturing. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I, I won't cover this one in detail, but what, what I wanted to cover is that 
one of the challenges of deep learning is that you need a lot of data to train. Uh, the problem with uh, manufacturing process is that sometimes the data distribution changes because of changes in the process itself. So we need theoretical to retrain a lot of time this model and can take can take time. And sometimes the data is scarce because there are new machines, so the data may be missing because you know failure has happened. So we can use transfer learning to support the development of more scalable and reusable deep learning models. So when uh, uh, we transfer learning, basically we have, uh, um, basically the idea is to use a, a, pre, a model that has been trained on a machine and retrain it on a small data set by two methods, fine tune, which basically you train the last, the few, the few layers and then uh, weight reuse where you are only reuse the weight. Okay. So I'll try to move a little bit fast because um, I think I don't know whether the timing is from when we start 50 minutes or we need to stay in the hour. Because <laughs> no, I no, got 35 minutes. Yeah, okay. You are fine, you are fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, good. Fine. So, but I think I want to give you kind of the idea. Uh, and I think this is the kind of the, the key point. So let's suppose that we have eight machine, uh, nine machine, and we train the model on one machine, very accurate model. Now, if we want to reduce this model for other machines, we have uh, a behavior, you know, variation in the behavior for several. So this is the gain, how much we gain, you know, by, um, you know, training, uh, you know, retrain the models from scratch compared to use the model that has been developed with this body maker machine nine. So some cases we can easily reuse we train the model on one machine, we can use it across the other machine. In some other cases, machine one and five, no. And this is because these two machines have got different distribution of the data, which I'm not showing here, but this is the main reason. So we can see, so then through transfer learning, you know, we can then, what we do, we reuse the model trained on body maker nine, and we use a small data set and we retrain the model. And this shows that, you know, even with a small data set, we can achieve a good model. Of course, if we have the whole data set, then there is no difference between, you know, doing the transfer learning from machine, the machine nine to retrain for, for that, that machine. So we have demonstrated, and this is really powerful, that we can actually scale up the model deployment across the factory by using transfer learning, which means you take a model trained on, on a system or an asset and you just retrain um, to be able to develop a new model and it takes less time and the model is still accurate. Okay, good. Uh, I've covered these four case studies. Uh, um, so I would like to start a little bit of reflection. I think, you know, in some kind of drawing some conclusion for here. Uh, I'm very passionate about deep learning. We have shown the potential of deep learning to drive productivity improvement and sustainability. However, you know, and we have applied, you know, to many different to different sectors. We've shown computer vision, transfer learning, time series forecasting. Uh, however, uh, you know, I mean, we we can adopt these technologies. Uh, however, we still have, uh, uh, you know, gaps in the data, problems with uh, scalability, and uh, we can solve partially them through uh, transfer learning and hybrid, hybrid approaches. So from a technical point of view, we think, you know, really the, these technologies are mature and we've got the data set. Yes, it's hard to create a pipeline, but, uh, you know, we can apply deep learning model to uh, industry. However, there are still some barriers, and those barriers are because people don't trust this model. Can we really integrate them? Is it safe? Is it secure? And can we trust this model? And do we have the right skills? So, and you know, we saw a whole range of issues. Will AI, you know, take my job? So there are a lot of, you know, societal issues that uh, apply to, you know, the deployment of AI in manufacturing. So this is where we, you know, we go. We're going next, and um, I, you know, I talked about how Industry 4.0 is evolving. How can we address all these, you know, potential issues and more cultural issues? 
uh, related to adoption of AI in manufacturing. And this is through what we call Industry 5.0. So Industry 5.0 is a new concept that puts uh, you know, humans and the interests and needs of humans at the heart of the production process. So we are able to develop human-centric solutions and we are able to develop more resilient and sustainable factories. So linking Industry 4.0 to sustainability, to resilience, and to human-centric system is like key to address some of these challenges. So my work is kind of now evolving towards the development, the development of more human-centric AI and uh, development of what we call hybrid modeling, where we combine physics-based, data-driven, and symbolics and rules logic-driven model. And these are the things that we are doing in the future. So develop better platforms for better interactions, looking at explainability, neurosymbolic AI, and also looking at the research translation and creation of toolkits. And I finished. So these are uh, my details and uh, links to our uh, Mantilla Manufacturing Research Institute, which formed a year ago. There is a nice video um, if you want to look at Thank you. Thank you, Sinjia, for a nice talk and uh, you're right on time as well. Uh, yes. So, no, I have, yeah. I have, I have, I have got like my my phone and it's 40 minutes. Yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> but, that's I know, right. but I was looking yeah. because we started a little bit. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good. Why, that's yeah, I try, I try yeah we have more time, time now yeah. for uh, some yeah. questions. Yeah. yeah. Any questions to Sinjia? Yeah, Sumit. Hi, um, quick question on um, with your vision learning um, models, did you have an issue with actually taking the image, capturing the images uh, in an industrial environment? Um, and the second one is for the physics based models that you had. Um, did you use the physics base to develop a data set to train your AI models? Yeah, so we go then one by one. So I, yes, I, yes, we had an issue. So in fact, you know, we had an issue, so let me go um, back to the uh, image. Yeah. Can you see, see, see the presentation? I don't want to, to remove it from uh, the full, okay, no, sorry. Um, so yes, absolutely. And this is the clever work that uh, Callum, my NGD has done. <laughs> so yes, uh, you know, it's not like, you know, taking off the shelves. You know, it took several months to develop this. We had several issues, especially when the ladle was moving into this area. You know, here, they were, was like completely off. So what uh, uh, we've done, I mean, a lot of denoising, and then we have applied this Kalman filter, which enable to, you know, it's a rigid body, so we are able to track the geometry. You know, it's not like, uh, you know, you see a random object and you've got to detect that there is an object. We know what the object looks like and, you know, the movement. So by do, using this Kalman filter, we have been able to, you know, to track it, especially when it comes to the very noisy part of the video. So, yeah, it's not just using off-the-shelf method. It's a lot of, you know, using combining different techniques for filtering, for, you know, noise reduction, that uh, uh, which is then specific to the environment. I would say, I mean, the methodologies can be duplicated, but then, you know, what you need to do and the way you need to tune it is specific to the environment. And it's done, uh, you know, a little bit automated, but a little bit, you know, just by trying. And take, it takes time, but once it is trained, you know, it kind of works very well. Does it answer to the question? It does. Uh, we tried um, um, HDR cameras that seemed to work quite well uh, with some work on stamping. Uh, so that that was our experience with uh, with imaging um, and and using images for for with with AI. Good. Well, yeah, I would be you know happy to have a chat of you know your experience. These are um, are just kind of normal cameras. We've got two cameras, but um, you know these are kind of not specialized camera you know they are like standard cameras and uh, you know we've been quite successful in you know just using kind of st standard equipment that might be better equipment 
but um, yes, so these are, um, but it takes, it takes time. Sorry, I'm just, uh, okay. I don't see you anymore. Okay, here, okay, because. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, I think if I, I do this one, so I see people, okay, oh. good. Uh, okay, second question. Uh, yes, so uh, what we do, what we do, uh, let me take this. Uh, yes, we have this steady state model, okay, which is taken from the books, the theory, but we are tuning it, you know, for the process itself. And we, we give uh, this, uh, we call it calculated SI as additional data. So we, I mean, I call it physics informed. Um, you know, some people they use the physical model and as a part of the loss function um, uh, to constrain some of the physics, you know, because otherwise this model, they just give results that might not have a physical sense, They're just learning kind of random pattern from the data, I would say. So some people, they, they use the model to constrain the neural network, uh, but in this case, uh, we use uh, the data derived from the model to argument the data that is existing. But, you know, it again is something that it takes a lot of time to kind of train and tune, and we are still uh, tweaking it. Hmm? Do you feel that using physics based models will uh, improve the acceptance of these models to engineers? Yes, yes, okay. yes, yeah. yes, okay. absolutely. So I again, I've gone a bit kind of quick towards the end because I wanted to wrap it up, but the trust, it's a big issue and this model gets developed and not deployed. So if you are, if you, you know, it's, it's not going to be a white box model because it's still a deep learning, but by giving a little bit of knowledge of the physics, you make it a little bit gray box and yep. you improve the trust. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Michael, you have anything to say? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> if there is no other questions, I'm happy to ask one. Uh, thanks a lot, Cynthia, for your question. I have probably a, a rather high level question. Um, a while ago, I read in an article um, about um, basically the, the problem of the input data, because essentially what we are doing in many machine learning algorithms is we take a data set, we train an algorithm. This is exactly how you do it and then we apply it on the model. Um, this form of data bias um, is, is basically leading to some problems. So, and, and the question in that article arose, whether we should rather train models or develop models, not to learn, but also to be able to forget some bad data. Um, what is your view on that, especially in the terms of, of the steel industry? Is this something yes. that will, touch us at some point soon or is this more like a far-flung idea in the future yeah uh it's learning from like more sp less data yeah i mean uh, you know there is this idea of deep learning that you the more data you throw at it and the better it is but it's not always true because we know that it i mean of course all the day, you know, I think in this type of environment, there is a lot of noise, there are gaps in the data. So that's not a paradigm that, you know, is going to help. I mean, if you are uh, identify everyday object, that, that's OK, but definitely. So this paradigm, more data, better model doesn't work. So, uh, yes. So I think there are there are several issues here. One is the, the noise of the data. So if we train noise, we're going to fit the noise. Uh, so the other problem is that the manufacturing processes are very dynamic. So the data distribution changes, the input data distribution. There is an underlying assumption of machine learning that the data distribution of the train and the test is the same. So, you know, if future data has got a different distribution, it's not going to work. And this is where transfer learning is useful to retune the models. So I like this idea of being able to forget, yes, because maybe at some point the dynamic of the system have changed. So maybe this whole data set, they are not relevant 
uh, anymore because you know the system wasn't there's been a, a change in the system you know even if even if you think about the machine and the tools that are wearing over time the behavior of the machine is gonna is gonna be different you know and the data distribution is gonna be different so yes i think being able to learn but also to forget very very important yes yes so I, I would be interested to, to read this uh, this paper. This is what a little bit the LSTM do in the context of you know time series for a casting. But I think that you know within manufacturing processes there should be a better way of doing it. Say okay, now my process has changed. I need I don't want to retrain from scratch, but I know that I need to forget this kind of this data. So yes, it's very interesting mm -hmm. point. And there is also you know a, a lot of you know. Um, uh talking about learning from sparse data from small data which are the meaningful one rather than learning from you know as a black box so yes those things are very relevant to manufacturing mm -hmm. yeah thank you thank you okay Thanks, i Michael. think uh aruranjan you have a question thank you yeah thank you for this presentation it's interesting i have quite a like two, three questions, which is interconnected and quick questions. First is you work with few of these uh, industry partners. Any of all from all of these work, any of it you try to implement it on the manufacturing field and it's successfully working or how things are happening there? That's the first question. Second question, I think you answered quite a bit in the last few slides and uh, to answering to Michael's uh, question. My point, like uh, why these AI models are not applied in industry or what is this hesitant is happening? One of the like few of the reasons you gave on your slides, but I think still likely you said in last time to Michael that uh, these data are like kind of dynamic, it's keep changing. So it's not that straightforward that we train a model we can directly use in a manufacturing. So what are any other these kind of difficulties except from those you presented in the slide. Is there any other difficulties which is happening so that industry is not accepting all uh, our models and stuff? Yeah, so you need to tell me again the first question. <laughs> the first question is, uh, 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 among all this work, uh, is there any of ah, yes, these the, work? The deployment. Yes, yeah. I mean, again, the deployment, it takes time. So uh, currently we are trying to deploy um, the computer vision, not, not particularly this one, other computer vision systems, because as you said, uh, you, you know, the deploy, so, you know, one of the, the other barrier to deployment, you know, is, I, mean, I, I mean, I mentioned actually, is the lack of skills. So I think companies, they need to, to you know, we are, we are demonstrating, okay? And we are showing that this model work, but then the full deployment, the company needs to take ownership of the full deployment. And you know, mm -hmm. lack of skills is a barrier. So they have, you know, we have we have shown proof of concept. They are not mainstream solution as yet. None of these yes. work. Hmm? Yeah. Okay. The the um, so that's 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 one thing. But we are a step closer compared to just doing some theoretical stuff because we are actually validating those model on real world data yes. sets and we are working towards a pipeline of deployment. Yeah. Yes, the barriers, the barriers are, uh, um, you know, you need, you know, so I think is is this part that, you know, I think what we discussed with Michael that the, the, the data is, you know, the, the processes are very dynamic. Um, you know, the deep learning model are very kind of black box. People don't trust them and uh, they are difficult to deploy it also because, uh, you know, people don't understand how they work and, you know, cannot use. Um, we also need to, you know, we have currently measure of performance, which we assess in root mean square error, MSC, but these are uh, really, uh, you know, some numbers that don't mean a lot. You know, what is the best yes. model for a company? Yeah, it's not it's not told by how accurate is the model because you might yes. have a less accurate model, but it's actually more transparent and preferable. Yeah. So it's about also perhaps thinking about kind of different measures of performance, mm -hmm. and uh, you know also being honest because you know when you you calculate the accuracies, an average accuracies, you know, 
being honest of you know the variation of the error mm -hmm. and you know another big field is being able to represent the uncertainty in uh, i mean which is i mean people are doing it but you know if if you just give a prediction then people say we don't know but you know if we've got uncertainty in the prediction then people start to to think yes i can use it or not but they, this is a whole field because you know what this uncertainty is it just means different things to different people so i think these are, uh, are the, the the data the, the availability of data is not an issue the data is there and um you know sometimes the other the other issue is about the data integration hmm? yes because these data come from different machines and different sampling, you know, it's sometimes sometimes these machines or these systems are disconnected. So the only way we have to um, aggregate the data is through timestamps, you know, because yeah, yeah. there is not yes. a point yeah. where you can link the data. You can, especially in the the when we were working with the metal packaging, you know, sometimes the the merge was kind of the timestamp. Again, it's not. It's it's not mm -hmm. the best reliable way of uh, aggregating data set. Uh, no further questions. Uh, I once again take this opportunity to thank uh, Sinjia for this uh, wonderful talk as well as for taking time. Thank you all. Let's uh, give an applause to Sinjia. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. And if you need any further information or you want to read the, the you know paper or things, I'm happy to kind of provide. I, I felt I just gave a like high level overview because just to show the, the different type of work we are doing. Thanks a lot for inviting yeah. me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks thank you. very much. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Bye bye. Everyone.